Hi, I'm Ken Spector with LivingEco.com, and I'm here today once again with Josh Tekel and Rebecca Tekel. Last time I interviewed you, you were Rebecca Harrell, and now you're Rebecca Tekel. And the film is called The Big Fix, and it's your film. You're the co-director and producer. You're the producer and director. What made you two decide to work on this film and make this film? We decided to make the film when the oil spill happened because we went to the beach, dug under the sand on the beach in Louisiana, and right under the sand was thick black oil. When I say oil, it wasn't gooey, it was tar-like, like like a paste. Once you got it on your hands, it literally took a week or two to wash it off. That's how thick it was. So remember, the original Coast Guard estimate was that 100,000 barrels of this stuff was leaking into the Gulf every single day. Well, if they were covering it up with sand, and there's 100,000 barrels of it coming out of that well site, then that's a pretty big smoking gun. We realized immediately that if we didn't tell the story, it likely wasn't going to get told. Because, honestly, that was the most obvious thing to do. And if the media wasn't doing that, what else were they missing? Were these beaches that were open or are open to the public? Technically, that beach was closed. We went on a day when there was a hurricane coming, so the police and the security had left the beach. We were able to walk straight down on the beach. The Coast Guard came right by us, though, and did not ask us to leave. So there was, I mean, we were down there frequently. We saw oil on the beach, people swimming in the water. You'd drive down the road, there'd be giant signs saying, you know, tourism, is, we're back in business, it's all been made right, demand Louisiana shrimp. Meanwhile, we'd be out on the water seeing signs of visible oil in the very water where the shrimp was being fished and where people were and young children were swimming yeah part of the part of the disconnect is this this story really is about an alternate narrative so how far can you push people where they actually believe a different reality than what they can see and what's happening around them and what we see in the big fix is you can actually make people believe a total myth a total fakery, which is what we're seeing still in the Gulf of Mexico. People are eating the fish, people are on the beach, people are in the water, and the signs say it's fine, it's safe to swim. Meanwhile, tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people are suffering with acute blood disorders, bleeding coming out of the ears, the nose. Uh, We're seeing sores, we're seeing what Rebecca had, which is uh, this, this, this terrible blistering and photosensitivity. So can you talk a little bit about that? What happened now? Yeah, I mean, we went down there to cover the story. We had heard that, like Josh said, um, what was really going on wasn't being reported. And one of the main things that was going on was that people were getting sick. And we had started to see people that were reporting that they had blood coming out of their ears, that they had these huge welts on their skin. And then when we went down to the beach, I immediately noticed that I had a headache, I had burning eyes, I had a sore throat. Um, But after a few times being out there on different occasions, I started to have different symptoms. The first thing that happened was all the skin on my feet started to peel off. Um, I also started getting chronically sick. I noticed that I had blood in my urine. And then um, I had this rash that wouldn't go away. And finally, what it's been diagnosed as, it's called tar smarting. And for the rest of my life, I have been told by doctors that I will not be able to expose the skin on my neck and chest to the sun. At all, even with sunblock. It's there, I, the sunblock, yeah, doesn't, sunblock work. doesn't work. It's it's just any exposure to the sun whatsoever. So for the rest of my life, I have to hide my skin. I mean, and that's that sucks. Yeah. You know, but it's not the end of the world for me. The problem is that there are hundreds of thousands of people that are being exposed still to this day to high levels of toxins from the oil that is still leaking and the dispersant that has still been sprayed as late as eight weeks ago. You know, today it's November in 2011. We have reports that in August and September, there are people are still seeing them spraying from the planes. And that's, you know, really upsetting, especially since last night I talked to a toxicologist um, who was telling me that women all along the Gulf are having miscarriages and um, there are malformed babies, like the same type of thing that happened after people were exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam. We've only seen the beginning. When do you feel like, I mean, in six months, what is this going to look like? I think it's actually going to go worse. I think we're seeing right now sort of a moment of realization to some degree in some of the population that live on the Gulf. We're also seeing part of that is because the shrimping shrimping industry is really dead in Louisiana. The shrimping industry has gone from what it was to less than 1% today. And the crabbing industry is the same way. 
So we're seeing huge populations of certain types of shellfish in the Gulf of Mexico actually completely collapse, which is the sign of the beginning of ecosystemic collapse. If this continues unabated, if it doesn't get the attention it needs, if the myth continues to be you know, what's perpetuated, uh, the oil is going to continue to leak, the Corexit is going to continue to spray, the toxic load on the Gulf is actually going to increase, and we're going to see a full ecosystemic collapse. Now, no one wants that. That's not the objective. I think the objective is for an honest review of what's happening, for the environmental groups to get back into Louisiana, for the media to get back into Louisiana, and really hone in on the three stories which are relevant. One, the oil is still leaking. Two, the shrimp and fish are coming up sick. And those that that aren't coming up is a massive population. We're missing, uh, in some cases, 99% of the fish population. And, and again, uh, people think this doesn't affect us here in Los Angeles, but let's say you eat chicken, as probably 70 to 80% of the folks watching this video do. That chicken, the protein for that chicken comes from sheep, it comes from um, fish caught in the Gulf of Mexico, specifically manheaton. That's a small fish that feeds the majority of the chicken in the United States. The reason the FDA forced the reopening of the fishing grounds was because they felt it was a national security issue, a food security issue. If we didn't have the protein to feed to our poultry in this country, we would actually have a meat shortage. They didn't want to deal with that. So instead, they reopened the fishing grounds knowing that they were covered in oil and Corexit, knowing that they hadn't been adequately tested, most mostly hadn't been tested at all. And so now we in Los Angeles, wherever we go out to eat, unless it's an organic free range local chicken, we're eating a toxic substance in concentrate from the Gulf of Mexico. So the second issue is really a food and ecosystem issue. And the third issue is human health. We have a massive population, which is affected by the airborne toxins. Remember, when you've got ocean spray, you breathe that air. Here we are in Venice Beach. We're four or five blocks from the actual beach. We're breathing the air from that water, the spray. Well, imagine the density of population along the Gulf Coast from Corpus Christi, Texas, all the way to Key West, Florida. We're talking about a massive population. You can see very quickly why insurance companies might not want to deal with something this endemic, why even the government itself might be scared to really deal with this, especially because if the oil is still leaking, as the pictures and evidence collected by LSU and other organizations show, then BP is liable for every barrel of oil that comes out of the ground. Well, if you really count the barrels and don't hide them with Corexit, you could potentially be looking at the bankruptcy of one of the largest corporations in the world. That doesn't sit well with English pensioners who have the majority of their pension funds wrapped up in BP, and it probably doesn't sit well with certain people in the U.S. government knowing that BP is the single largest supplier of fuel to the U.S. Department of Defense. So that's what the big fix really is. It's about a situation, it's about a catch-22, where If you do expose the truth, something else has to give, and whatever has to give is pretty big. But if you don't expose the truth, the the decimation of human health and environmental consequences is massive. So we're in the middle of that catch-22, and I think it's going to take a little while for the media to really wake up, to really get out there, to get the evidence, and to get their heads around the size of this story. Right when everybody left the Gulf Coast is when the story got huge. We know because we stayed. Uh, and, and once that story catches on, yeah, I think there will start to be retribution. There will start to be you know, legal action. There will hopefully eventually be a ban on Corexit with some kind of legislative and, and, uh, and police body that can ensure it's not being done at night. And even when those things happen, we're then going to have to begin a very, very, very long process of environmental resuscitation for a biosystem which we've only just begun to understand. So it's not a simple story. There's no Band-Aid solution. Uh, it's, 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 it is the example of how far we will go to get our energy and how wide the cultural trance and the mythology that we're put under to make us think that it's okay, how intense that mythology can be. 
Now I notice, and you can see it in the uh, in the poster here. You two are wearing gas masks. Now I didn't I notice anyone else was wearing gas masks. I noticed the guy who was piloting the boat or was driving the boat. He wasn't wearing a gas mask. What's with that? Why were you the only two that I saw wearing gas masks? Well, you know, we were constantly being told not to wear gas masks. In fact, we were threatened by other workers who were out there saying, don't wear that. You're going to scare people. You're going to cause panic. We had the Coast Guard yell at us. There was a widespread agreement that everything was fine. Don't mess with it. It's all been made right. You know, let us just keep covering the sand up with the oil up with sand and spraying it and out of sight, out of mind. So when we would wear a gas mask, that was threatening the agreement that everything was fine. And so, you know, we had, I had started getting sick at that point. So Josh was absolutely insistent that we not go out there and expose ourselves like that ongoingly because I was already having these horrible things happen to me. And um, if it hadn't been for us wearing gas masks and Josh insisting that we do that, the same condition that I have on my neck and chest would have also happened to my face. It's another example of, you know, again, the, the, the profit being put above the well-being of the people. It's like, how can we accept the fact that our government and all of the entities down there that were working on this would allow people to risk their lives by being exposed to that that high level of toxins so that they could look good. Yeah. I, it's crazy to me. So that we would continue to go and fill up on their gas. And that's ultimately the bottom line. I mean, it's easy for us to all to just sit here and say, oh, well, it's you know the oil company's fault. But the fact of the matter is, for us to get from point A to point B, we, the majority of American population uses gasoline. And that's the root cause of all of this. What is BP hiding? You tried to talk to BP, and we didn't see any talking heads for BP in the film. Why was that? The bottom line is one of the issues that we, we specifically wanted to ask BP and have them say on camera was we wanted to say, has there been any more use of Corexit since July 2010 when BP and the EPA officially announced they had stopped using Corexit? And the reason I, pretty surely that they didn't want to give an interview is because they didn't want to say, no, absolutely not. There's been no use of Corexit and then have us prove that Corexit was being ongoingly used. Because let's face it, the U.S. government isn't contracting the corrects it to be used. NOAA isn't contracting. The Coast Guard isn't contracting. The only entity that can realistically contract the corrects it to be used is the spiller because it's the spiller's response to deal with the spill under federal law that was established during the Exxon Valdez. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, doesn't matter how many companies are between BP and the use of Corexit, it is ultimately BP's accountability that that Corexit continues to be used. So that was the main issue, and it continues to be the main issue to this day. If oil is leaking, you've got to hide it. If you don't hide it, people see it. If people see it, you're eventually going to be fined for it. So it's this ongoing dance. It's this game where as long as they can infuciate reality with the media ads, with the sort of the, you know, billboards, the posters, the, oh, the Louisiana shrimp festivals and all of these things, uh, and they can hide the oil at the same time, they can keep the game going. But at some stage, science has to catch up with myth. And that's what we're seeing. Ed Overton, who was the lead professor at LSU dealing with the oil spill, whose department received a $10 million grant under BP, direct grant from BP, who began by saying this, this is a tar-like, thick, hard, it's not like a crude, it's like a tar and then switched his tune after the grant, Ed Overton even tested the new fresh oil that's coming from the deep water site. And he said, this has the exact same chemical signature as the oil from the deep water horizon. It can only be from one place, the Macondo well. Mm -hmm. So we know the oil is still leaking. It's proven. It, you can't re refute that. And they're going to say, well, it seeps in the ocean floor. There were no seeps in the ocean floor before the Deepwater Horizon sank. So we know where the oil is coming from. It's, it's likely at this point that there are some fissures, and, and that's a significant problem because you've got a sandstone reservoir at thousands of PSI over a mile deep. And if there are fissures, if there are actual cracks, or if the wellhead itself isn't securely positioned, if that cement isn't bonded correctly, there's a much larger issue here, and that is that that oil won't stop leaking anytime soon. 
So it, it becomes a very difficult conversation, and that's a conversation that BP has shied away from. Were you able to get that on camera and not use it? No. Uh, it, you know, they were very uh, coy in the interview and, and were very good at moving around the questions, but there was enough material there in the interview to show the kind of tactic that's being used on a PR angle. And even that was denied. We were denied permission to use that. Unbelievable. Josh, what would you have done had you been CEO of BP when this disaster happened? And what would you be doing now? There were six really clear pathways to deal with the oil spill. The first and and simplest was oil floats on top of water in a natural form, even this thick tar-like oil. Uh, So, you know, provided that I would have had to have stepped into a position where rules were already broken. Because remember, the Deepwater Horizon was designed to disallow this kind of situation from happening. It had it had automatic shutdown systems. It had triple layer of protection. It had warning systems. It was satellite positioned. It was in constant communication, multiple times a second, with several land bases. So it wasn't a surprise to everyone who's involved on a technical level. The actual people in the industry fully understood that they were pushing this piece of machinery beyond what it was designed to be pushed to do. They had physically turned off the majority of the warning systems on the rig. That would be like me telling you to fly an airplane, but turn off the warning lights. So it, it, they knew that they were drilling in a gas pocket. They knew that mud pressure had already dropped two weeks before. They knew that essentially everything the rig could do to shut itself off, to tell them to stop, to attempt to circumnavigate the drilling process, the rig systems were trying to shut the rig down. It was doing what it was designed to do in an emergency situation. And they went around it, and they went around it, and they went around it. So the first thing, I think the first thing, before we even talk about the spill, that we have to be clear about is that we can't have an oil industry that operates outside of regulation. We can't have an oil industry that takes a piece of equipment that's designed to operate within safe parameters and then operates it inside of dangerous parameters because it feels like it. That's the first thing that the CEO should have done is maintained a true track record of safety, not a fake track record of safety. You know, painting a green logo on a gas station doesn't mean that your drilling operations is safe. And that costs 11 people's lives. So in my opinion, everyone at the top of BP is accountable for the 11 deaths, as well as the ongoing deaths that we're seeing now in the Gulf of Mexico from the exposure to oil and Caraxit. And that's a huge claim of malfeasance that hasn't been brought to bear. But I think over time, we're going to see the justice system kick in here. So first and foremost, the CEO should have ensured the operability of the company within legal and uh, reasonable safety limits. He failed. Secondly, the CEO should have made sure that the cleanup operation was, in fact, a cleanup operation, which means that to clean the oil up, you actually have to get the oil. there are many designs, uh, many, many companies were available to establish a colander-like uh, apparatus that would have basically been dropped into the water from a floating ring, massive floating ring, and fallen down over the wellhead site, like a big pipe. And essentially, that would have captured the majority of the oil and brought it up. There's a large Chinese tanker ship called the Whale. The Whale was brought in, but very late. It is it, This whale ship has the ability to separate a tremendous amount of water from oil. Remember, the oil industry is in the business of separating oil from water. When the oil comes up out of the sandstone reservoir, it's actually mixed with water. You have to, you have to lubricate and force water into the well pipe to get oil out. So as it comes up, it's mixed with water. The rigs themselves have massive centrifuges that separate oil from water. So there's no lack of knowledge inside the oil industry about taking oil and pulling it out of water. That's what the rigs do. So essentially, the whale was just a large rig. It had multiple centrifuges that was able to, to separate a tremendous amount of oil from the water. You could have established a colander zone, a pipe, brought the whale in, and essentially you could still be sucking up the oil from that wellhead. 
that would have been the most prudent thing to do. And still to this day would probably be the most prudent thing to do. From there, you could investigate bioremediation and biological processes that would augment the natural processes and create really a hot zone around that well site, which was never created. We never created a marine hot zone where we said, okay, how do we deal with this impact area? How do we deal with the wildlife, the dolphins? How do we deal with this? And, and do it in an ecologically responsible way. So those were the steps that should have been taken, and they weren't. Ongoingly, what's not being done, no new safety regulations in the Gulf of Mexico, no new drilling operations uh, that have in any way changed the behavior. Remember, the second permit, the first permit issued was to a partnership with BP. They're operating under the exact same paradigm as they operated before. The Deepwater Horizon is not the only deepwater rig out there. They have other deepwater rigs like Thunder Horse and others that are under manufacturing that are slowly being moved into the Gulf of Mexico. So essentially, the CEOs and the top people in BP are doing exactly the same thing they did before the Deepwater Horizon spill with no federal restrictions whatsoever. Do you foresee any positive coming out of this spill? I mean, are there any stories that, you know, that are a little more positive? I mean, this really sounds grim. And the fact that the core exit is still being used today, the fact that the oil is still spilling, I mean, it sounds like we're heading into a global disaster. I am sad to say that, you know, we've been living this nightmare for the last 16 months. And um, it has been pretty grim. And to, to deal with it has been very challenging on so many levels. It's made me really question our democracy because, I mean, this goes straight to the heart of the White House, the fact that Obama claimed to have swum in the water and didn't actually and said that the fish is safe when, in fact, it's not. You know, it was really a huge disappointment that the people weren't taken care of and protected in the situation. Um, the thing that brought us down there in the first place was our commitment that this was the turning point, that this was the moment when America realized the impact of our fossil fuel addiction, that this was the line in the sand where we were going to say no more. And unfortunately, because the situation has been so well covered up, so well covered up, not covered by the media, but you know, hidden from the media, hidden from the public. Um, you know, unfortunately, it hasn't been that turning point as of yet, and that's why Josh and I are still here, saying, no, this is an important issue. This is something that everyone has to take a look at. This is something that we all have to be aware of because it's not just affecting these people in the Gulf of Mexico. This is affecting everyone. This is poison that's slowly working its way up the food chain, and it's also poisoning the sixth largest body of water on the planet. This affects all of us. So what I believe will come out of this is a very, um, very profound awakening. You know, when people realize what's really going on, suddenly you think twice before you go and you automatically fill up your car, you know, half asleep. You know, there's there's a wake-up call in this for everyone. And it's really important that Josh and I continue to talk about alternative energy like we do in the other films that we've made, but, you know, it doesn't really make a difference if people don't see why we must, why we must make this choice off of fossil fuels, because if we don't make that choice now, what we're seeing in the Gulf of Mexico is just the tip of the iceberg. What can people that are watching this interview right now do? Um, I mean, this is a catastrophic problem that we're dealing with right now, but what can they do? Without trying very hard, Josh and I were able to convert our Prius to get 150 miles per gallon. And when we drive around Venice in, in our Prius, we don't use any fossil fuel. It's completely in electric vehicle mode. Um, we also use ethanol in our car. We made a whole movie about how there's this whole cover up about ethanol, like the one fuel that could completely shift this whole situation. And we, the environmentalists, have been the biggest enemy of that. So there's a lot of lessons in this for us. It's um, getting off of petroleum that includes plastic and includes what you put in your car. And then also just digging beneath the headlines and, and looking for alternative solutions because they're right there. You know, within our community, wherever you are, there is someone that can help you to make the shift. And that's what we've got to do before it's forced upon us. Thank you so much for you both for doing this incredible film. And I hope all of you get a chance to see this film. It's not only powerful, it's shocking at times, but you'll really get a better grasp of what's going on in the Gulf now. And it's not over yet. Yeah. This movie continues. So thank you so much, Josh. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.